it's exciting to be able to stand in front of you guys and be able to be able to bring a word that I strongly believe God has um, shared with me and for you guys today. If you can stand um, and open your Bibles, I'd like us to read. We're going to dive right into Scripture. I'd like you to open Exodus 31. Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17. I have several scriptures this morning, so keep your Bibles handy and ready. Or if you use it electronically, keep your finger ready to scroll. When you got it, say amen. 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 Exodus 31, starting 16 and 17. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. Keep that word in mind, forever. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, catch this, he rested and was refreshed. Keep those two words in mind. He was he rested and was refreshed. Now, if you can go over to Exodus 20. Exodus 20. Starting in verse 8. Oops. Hold on a second. For some reason, my phone. Ah, there we go. Remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigners residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Go ahead and take a seat. Thank you. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to close your eyes for a second. Just take a moment, close your eyes. I want you to take a nice deep breath in real slow, count to three, and breathe out, count to five. Do that once or twice for me. And keep your eyes closed even after you're done. I am so tired. I'm exhausted. I just don't have enough time. I have too much going on right now. I'll rest when I'm dead. How many times have you said that or thought that at any point in the last week or two? Go ahead and open your eyes for me. I'll be honest, I have. (laughs) Um, In fact, I probably have said every one of those statements within the last seven to 10 days. And... um, it's been quite a roller coaster with God as I've been preparing for this message because I feel like he put the word rest in my spirit because we are, Elliot did ask me to come and talk about disabilities since this is, um, this last week has been disability awareness for, um, for the church and for Ability Tree, our, her whole mission is to provide rest to provide recreation, education, support, and training. But God just simply said, no, 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 just rest, that word in and of itself. And so it's been, like I said, a bit of a roller coaster ride for me, um, just working through that and what does that mean. But even though I'm going to be bringing in some I, you know, elements of um, talking about families with disabilities, I think this is a topic, a subject that is very applicable to each one of us. Would you agree? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I, um, I want to look at how in Scripture, 
This word Sabbath was mentioned 141 times. That's in the Old Testament and New Testament. So that should catch our attention. That's incredibly important to the Lord that we find Sabbath. And in Scripture, the one that we read a moment ago, where it talked about Sabbath, it was actually referring to intermission. And as you know, an intermission is really important for those who are in performing, either it being the performing arts, it being a sport, um, sport event, even a debate. Having an intermission is incredibly important because it allows them a moment in the midst of all that they're doing and they're obligated to, to rest before then continuing on and getting ready for their second half. And so in scripture, it's referring to that same concept that God's saying, get her done, six days, intermission, Sabbath, rest, take a moment. And it's take a moment to breathe, not to, okay, it's my Sabbath, so now I'm going to go grocery shopping because I'm not actually sending emails. It's literally stopping and to take a breath. God has a reason for establishing his Ten Commandments, right? Each commandment has a purpose in it. And I don't think him asking us to remember the Sabbath is any different. But it's interesting. I actually heard a pastor, Pastor Pastor Morris um, from Gateway Church. He was talking about how it's interesting that we as Christians look at the Ten Commandments and only follow nine of them. And for some reason feel that the Sabbath is an optional command where actually it's one of the four commands that is punishable by death in the Old Testament. So I would say God takes it pretty seriously. Now, while we may not be bound by that law anymore, there's still consequences and we'll get to that in a moment. So today I want to share three things about the Sabbath and what I feel God has laid on my heart, probably more for me than anything, but um, I feel also can apply to you guys because I know some of you are caregivers. Some of you are just busy in in the workplace, family life, school. And so I think that this applies to all of us. The three things I want to talk about is the need, the consequences, and trust. So the first thing looking at is the need. And as I mentioned, the Sabbath is so significant to God that he actually placed it as one of the all-time top 10, right? He he wanted us to do it. And in in the other um, commands, he's like, don't do this, don't do that. But with Sabbath, he says, remember this, which I find interesting because I think he knew us better. He knew how things would be in 2018, And so he was planning back then, hey, listen, remember this, because life is going to get chaotic, compromises will be okay, but I want you to remember the Sabbath, and there's purpose behind it. He certainly needed it. When you look at scripture in Genesis 2-2, you can go ahead and put that up, in Genesis 2-2, you see that even when God created the world it says by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. So he knew that we would need it. If God needs it, how much more do we need it in our lives as well? And so he completed creating the world in six days. And then he chose to create another day specifically for rest. He could have just done six days a week, restart, six days a week, restart, but he didn't. He actually created a seventh day so that we could rest. And he called it holy. If you can go to Exodus thirty-one seventeen. Back to that scripture that we were just looking at a moment ago. It 
I want to go back to the, the couple words that I had told you guys when we originally read it. It said, it will be a sign between me and the Israelites for how long? Forever. He made it very clear. This was not a, just a couple generations. It wasn't while you guys were, you know, not doing your thing. Forever. For in six days, God, the Lord made the heavens and earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. The Hebrew word for refreshed literally means took breath. You think about it, for six days, God spoke the word and brought life into existence. For six days, he exhausted himself and breathing out, breathing his spirit onto the world. And so on the seventh day, he finally breathed in and took that moment which is, you know, that expression, I need, I need a moment to breathe. Let me catch my breath, those type of things. And so God was probably up there saying, let me, let me catch my breath. And he's had a moment so that he could find rest as well. He gave it to us as a gift. Like I mentioned a moment ago, he could have just cycled the days over and over again, but he gave it to us as a gift because he recognized how important it was, how it was good to just have a moment to be still, to exist, not to be responsible for having to do 50 million things in that day. Which leads me to um, Psalms 23. If you can go there. Psalms 23, verse 2. Let me know when you're there. Say amen. Amen. All right. I found this interesting. Um, He says, the Psalm of David says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. And when I was reading that, I mean, how many times have we read that scripture over and over again. I mean, that's like one of the like primary verses when growing up as a kid in kids' church is to know the scripture. But I I caught it as in three steps that David recognized needs to happen. One is that he's saying, he makes me lie down in green pastures, where to lie down in Hebrew is ravats, and it means to recline, to make rest, and to just simply sit. Well, if you are sitting, particularly in those times, you are pretty much just existing. And so he's saying, look, the Lord makes me to lie down. He, he brings me to this point where I stop and sit in green pastures. And then once that happens, the next, the next thing is then he leads me beside quiet waters, which literally is waters of rest. So once I have finally stopped, he then is able to lead me into waters of rest. And for that, we have this innate need to find that rest, to want to be led by him. And so when we get to that point where we're able to actually stop and rest, then we can finally allow God to lead in that. And then by doing so, he restores our soul. So then that's the result of us. So we can't just have our soul, souls restored without us doing something, without us make, taking action by stopping, allowing him to lead, and then being restored. Am I speaking to anyone today? because <laughs> I know I'm speaking to myself. And as difficult as I know as it, it is for us to get to that place, for those families that are impacted by disabilities, for those who have to be caretakers, it's even a greater struggle for them because they don't have the freedom to catch their breath. They don't have that time or that opportunity a lot of times to sit in green pastures or to allow themselves to be led through those still waters. And so they don't actually experience a lot of times restoration in their soul. 
because of all the responsibilities that they have. So when that doesn't happen, when we don't get to that place where we allow God on a regular basis, not once in a while, not for one week out of a year for a family vacation or a getaway, but when we regularly do it every week, allowing ourselves that moment to rest, when we don't, the next thing, the second part is consequences. If you look back on Exodus 31, let's go back a few verses before um, 16, 17. Let's look at 14 and 15. God spoke and said, observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. Those who do any work on that day must be cut off from their people. For six days, or yeah, for six days, work is to be done. But the seventh is the day of Sabbath rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath is to be put to death. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole argument of when is Sabbath, what day of the week it is. Um, that's, that's not at all where I'm going with this. Um, but what I am saying is that even though we don't live under that law where we will be put to death for lifting a finger, breathing a little too heavily on the Sabbath, there are still natural consequences. And I think God recognized it then, or he knew, he didn't recognize it. He knew it and wanted us to recognize the consequences of it, which in fact today can in fact lead to death. Because if you think about it, when someone is sleep deprived, when they are completely wiped out and don't get to restore, their body actually starts to decline. They start having physical health problems like heart disease, heart attack, heart failure, high blood pressure, get a stroke, deal with diabetes, Um, Also, there's a risk of increase in accidents, which can lead to death, and even a risk of obesity. Those are actual physical things that can happen when we don't allow ourselves the time for rest. Also, mental wellness. You start dealing with forgetfulness when you're sleep deprived or completely exhausted on a regular basis. You um, increase in anxiety, increase in depression. Um even sometimes suicidal thoughts, thinking that maybe it would be just easier not to have to deal with this at all. And then also just overall slowing of your cognition, of your ability to think straight is impacted. And then the other thing is your relationships. When you are on the go constantly, it starts to impact your family life. It starts to impact your marriage. It impacts your children. It even impacts your extended family that you have because you're in a constant state of motion. Not to mention... You start to have low tolerance when you're tired, right? Or maybe that's just me. I don't know. Um, (laughs) A little bit more moody. And you're just too exhausted to actually do things that God created family and relationships to be for us to invest in each other. And so maybe you've experienced some of those consequences in the past. Um, Maybe you're going through it right now. Um, either way, it's hard to, you know, to get past, even more so for these families with disabilities because they don't have the support system in place a lot of times to able to get the rest so that they're not completely fatigued. There's actually a higher increase in divorce rate for those families because of the, the stressors that are on the family. There is... Um, an increase in um, a lot of, sometimes there's an increase in uh, family family structure. There's a lot of um, stressors because siblings start to struggle with their parents being pulled away a lot. Um, even when looking at adult children, it's still the same kind of thing. A lot of times where they're like, okay, we're adults and my sibling is still needing all the attention, and it starts to to fray on them. They start to deal with that as well. And then also, they are mentally and physically exhausted at an earlier rate or age than their peers when they don't have the opportunity to find rest. I can talk, you know, just in my own life, um, when I did 
case management um, before the job that I'm doing right now, I worked um, for the first year at about 16 to 20 hours a day, seven days a week because of the demand that was on me. And that was just work. And then I had to then, obviously, I had Josiah and Jesenia. We just moved to St. Augustine, so dealing with that life change. My husband, the church, because we are now, you know, two years into being down here. And it got to a point where I couldn't think straight. I was making a whole lot more errors. Um, I was having a hard time staying awake. Um, I had to pull over a lot on the road because I was just completely exhausted, not to mention my family suffered greatly. My marriage started to be impacted by it um, because it was just a constant go, go, go. And even in my earlier earlier years with Josiah, the constant back-to-back-to-back appointments that I had to take him to, um, still needing to fulfill the responsibilities of working a full-time job, having Jacenia to, you know, take care of her because she's part of the family, making sure that she was not put on the back burner, and then, you know, continuing to work in, in my marriage. It was just a constant, and there would be times that I would just break down and cry and, and struggle with some depression because of those situations. I have um, a teenager that I work with now with special needs and his family is currently going through a divorce because they are not able to work through it together and it puts such stress and tension on their marriage that they decided to separate rather than to work through it. I have another that um, another individual with special needs that their family has backed away from them because a lot of their behaviors and their needs were greater than what they could do. And so rather than get support place supports in place, they just place them somewhere and has not had any relationship with them um, because of that. So there's a lot of things that happen. And the most recent thing was um, I was speaking with some parents um, trying to get an idea of what to do for these families because as you know we're going to be hopefully starting some respite nights and I had a teacher who works over at Murray and she has an elementary son with um, autism that's pretty significant with behaviors and then she has a preteen and a teenager and she just broke down to me saying my family's falling apart because now my kids are starting to rebel in order to get the attention that they need. I can't go out even to take them on a Friday night dinner because by the time we get there, there's a complete meltdown. Or if they don't have what my son wants, then we have a complete catastrophe happening and trying to get them out of the building. It's just not worth it to me anymore. And I hear those stories over and over and over again where it's just not worth it to them. So they end up becoming isolated from their family because they're embarrassed, they feel, you know, they get these comments of, well, you just need to discipline them more, not truly understanding what is actually going on um, with that individual. Um, They get disconnected from the church, and they get disconnected from the community as a whole, which, you know, as a church, that saddens me that that, um, that they would feel that way. So I want to um, look at the third thing is trust, the trust. The root, I would say the root of not following the Sabbath is because we don't trust God, that we don't believe that he can actually provide for us. So we are the ones who take it into our own hands to constantly work, to constantly get things done. We're the ones that are like, well, if it's going to be done right, I might as well do it. Um, am I the only one who thinks that too? Because, <laughs> um, and that's, you know, and that, but what that does is that that is now taking away from who God is. We are now saying, God, I don't really think you're sovereign. I don't think you're really capable. So I will handle my business and I'll catch you during a song in the car, listening on the radio. And we don't want that for ourselves. We don't want that for these families either. We can't be in control all the time. 
And when we aren't, that's when our stress level increases. That's when we work even harder. And that's when we get even more exhausted rather than saying, okay, God, I trust you in the situation. So I will slow down knowing that you got it already under control. So I, let me show you two examples in scripture about that. Because the Israelites did the same thing. Let's look at Exodus 16. Let's go to Exodus 16. We're going to start in verse 23, and we're going to read through 30. Let me know when you got there. We're good? Amen. All right. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is the day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Woo-hoo. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is the Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find it, find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there won't be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instruction? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. He gives you bread for two days. He gives you enough to get you through. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day, and no one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. So you see that even even the Israelites struggled with that, that here God commanded. I mean, it's just, I'm, I'm picturing it. God's like, okay, this is what I want from you guys. Six days work. I'm going to hook you up. You know, on the sixth day, I'll throw a little extra in there. You gather as much as you can. I'll make sure it doesn't stink. I'll make sure it doesn't get any maggots. We're good to go. You got this. Grab as much as you can for for those two days because there isn't going to be any tomorrow. And then we'll start over again on day one, okay? And so some people got it. They gathered it up. The next day, there wasn't any. It was perfectly good food. But... Some just couldn't trust God enough to provide that extra amount. And so shows up out in the fields to try to find some more. And of course, there isn't none because God made it very clear that there would be none on the Sabbath. Let me look, uh, let's look at a second example. Look at 2 Chronicles 36 2. 2 Chronicles 36. Oh, I'm not sorry, not two, verse 21. My apologies. Second Chronicles 36, 21. The land, the land enjoyed its Sabbath rest. All the time of its desolation, it rested until 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. So this is related to that the, the Israelites kept work in the fields, work in the fields, work in the fields. And the Lord had established that you work the fields for six years. And then on the seventh year, you let it rest. So God even created the earth to need rest. And so for six years, you do this. The seventh year, let it rest. You'll be taken care of. Don't worry about it. I got you. But what happened the Israelites stopped doing that. They slowly started getting into that seventh year, eighth year, ninth. So then next thing you know, year 14 rolls around, still doing it. Year 21, still doing it. Year 28, 28, yeah, sorry, I'm gonna do my math. And so on and so forth. And so when God said, now you will be kept captive, you will be slaves for 70 years, That is to fulfill the prophecy in Jeremiah, saying that you'd be captive so that the land could rest. So God claimed it back because if you figure it out, 
So 70 years, that was 490 years that they kept working that ground, that they did not let that ground rest for 490 years. And so God's like, you know what? We're done. Do you think probably after, you know, by the time they got to like 489 year, they're like, oh, God totally doesn't mind apparently. But no, God prophesied that this isn't how it's going to be. And so he literally had to take them captive to get them to stop. We don't want that to happen to us, do we? We don't want where God has to completely shut us down in order to get our attention so that we will rest. We don't want that. And I realize, I recognize that in my in my own life, that if I don't make that choice to stop, that one day God can be like, okay, Joanne, let me, let me help you out here. Because I've already, you know, I was, I was kind. I gave you the word, take a breath, take a Sabbath. But if you're not going to follow that, I will make it happen for you because I recognize the importance and I don't want you suffering the consequences of it. So do you, provi- you know, do you trust that God will provide for you? Do you believe that you can, in fact, stop and take a rest? Now, it may look different for each one of us, what that might look like. But God's looking at the heart and looking at what are you doing to honor the Sabbath to take that rest? Because I created it. I made it holy. And how can we as a church then help the families impacted by disabilities and special needs? How can we as a church help them find rest? How can we as a church help bring them in so that they can be restored and that they can find health again um, mentally, spiritually, and physically? Well, I have a few suggestions or thoughts that, um, that would be, in fact, breathe in rather than always breathing out. And then lastly is having a welcoming attitude and behavior, which I know for our church, you guys have had Josiah for, you know, the last eight years. And um, so I know for us, hearing kids, you know, being fussy, yelling, laughing, whatever the case may be, we just keep worshiping. We don't, and we need to allow these families to see that, that they can come through our doors because there was actually a study done um, amongst parents and they said that one of the biggest things was for leaving the church is because they got the stares, they got the comments. They were actually, there were some that have actually been told, I'm sorry, we don't have something here for you. And, um, And these are some of the reasons why families have left the church But what they would like is for people to actually look at the person with the disability and actually engage with them, not that they're just an accessory, but that they are, in fact, a valued person in the church, that they would be willing to come up and say, hey, why don't you let me sit with him for a little bit? And this isn't just children, it's even adult Um, adults with disabilities saying, you know what, how about I be their buddy? Let me sit with them today so that you can just focus on what's being said or focusing on the worship. Another thing is being willing to visit them, that it's not just inside these four walls, but that we are willing to visit them, that we are willing to put ourselves out there periodically or connect them to people that can help provide some level of respite for them. Also, if they're not there on a Sunday or two, that we would be willing to reach out to them, not just be like, oh, I guess they decided not to come anymore, but that we would have a vested interest. And we would do that for anyone, right? So if we would do it for anyone, we need to even do it more so because they already feel isolated. They already feel um, embarrassed a lot of times um, by how their, their child or their loved one acts. And so they want to be able to know that they can come to church and it'd be a a truly safe haven, which it should be for all people. Amen. Not just those with disabilities, but all people should feel safe coming into our church. And then also knowing that there's support long-term, that it's not a one-time deal. It's not just a one Sunday thing, but that we are willing as a church body to love them on a continual basis, that we are willing to help them out um, in moral supports, in, um, in time, those type of things as well, so that they can also experience rest. So 
we need to remember what Psalms 23, 2 says, those three steps, that we need to sit in green pastures, that we need to allow the Lord to lead us by quiet waters so that then we can be restored. And we need to be able to provide that to these families as well. If we can go ahead and close our eyes. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we're reminded today that you instituted the Sabbath. You instituted a day of rest. We're reminded even in Deuteronomy chapter 5 where you repeat the Ten Commandments and in verse 15, you remind us why we are to observe the Sabbath. You say, you should remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you, keep the Sabbath. Father, may we find rest knowing that you are the one who has delivered us. You are the one who has set us free. You are the one who has called us and you paid the price so that we might live in you, that we might breathe in you, that we might have our being in you. Father, we trust you today. If at any point in our lives we have ever felt the need to take control of our destiny and of our life, we ask that you would forgive us, that you would cleanse us, and that you would open our minds and our hearts to receive the gift that you have freely given to us in Christ Jesus the gift of life, and life more abundantly in you, through you, for you, because of you. I thank you. I thank you.